Football is by some distance the most popular sport played on planet Earth. According to a worldwide survey conducted by the Fédération Internationale de Football Association, better known as FIFA, over 240 million people regularly engage with football. This figure equates to around 1 in every 25 of the world's total population, a figure that has likely risen since the survey was conducted in the summer of the year 2000. While football is undeniably popular, a very small number of football fans are particularly knowledgeable about the history of their favourite sport. In the UK, the consensus is that football was invented in England, with the creation of the modern rules of the game in 1863 generally offered up as the true starting point of the sport. However, in reality, the history of football predates the Industrial Revolution by several thousand years. Not only this, but the history of the world's favourite sport is far more global than most football fans in the UK would have you believe. The common consensus in the UK is that the modern sport can trace its origins back to mob football in medieval England. The term mob football relates to an archaic sport usually played between two villages. The objective of the sport was to transport a ball, usually an inflated pig's bladder, to a pre-designated point, usually in one village or another. Mob football significantly predates the codification of the modern game, with the sport first mentioned in Historia Britonum, a text that most scholars believe dates to the mid 9th century. While there are some superficial similarities to modern football, primarily two teams attempting to manipulate a ball to a pre-designated area on the far end of a field of play, in practice mob football was no more similar to modern football than it is to hockey or most rugby codes. In fact, players were not even required to use their feet to manipulate the ball. The historian Gene Williams suggests that the name football is actually derived from the fact that the sport was played on foot, as opposed to more aristocratic sports that were played on horseback. It was not until 1363, some 500 years after the Historia Bretonum was written, that mob football can seemingly be differentiated from other sports. In a royal decree, Edward III prohibited what were referred to as idle games, which included handball, football or hockey, distinguishing football from other popular sports of the day. While the English were busy spending the Dark Ages throwing a pig's bladder around a field, people from other countries were beginning to codify sports that bore a far more striking similarity to modern football. Cicero, the Roman statesman who was a contemporary of Julius Caesar, wrote about a situation where an inflated leather ball was kicked into a barber shop in Rome, resulting in a patron's death. This situation was likely caused by a game of harpustum, a ball game similar to rugby that was popular within the Roman Empire. The name of the sport was derived from the Latinization of the Greek word for seize or snatch, suggesting that the game was played as much with the hands as with the feet. For the first widely documented sport wherein a spherical ball was manipulated exclusively with the feet, we had to journey to China during the Han Dynasty. Tsuju is first mentioned in Sima Chan's Shiji, which suggests it dates anywhere between 202 BC and 220 AD. The Shiji states the sport originated from fitness drills practiced by the military, before becoming a professionalized source of entertainment in prosperous cities such as Linzhe in Shandong province. In 2019, I briefly lived and worked in Shandong, where I had the opportunity to visit the Linzer Football Museum and experience Suju firsthand. While the rules of the game are quite different to modern football, two teams of players attempt to kick a ball through a hoop in the middle of a pitch rather than kick the ball into goals on opposing sides, in practice Suju resembles modern football far more closely than mob football, both in terms of technique and equipment. The boots worn by players are studded and tapered, resembling to an eerie degree the football boots worn in Britain during the 1950s. Additionally, the ball is a stitched, inflated leather affair that is similar to balls used in the early development of modern football. This footage of Manchester City midfielder Bernardo Silva playing Suju shows how familiar the sport is to modern footballers. Put the Portuguese playmaker in a game of mob football and he may not fare so well. Suggesting that Suju is the true progenitor of modern football is a contentious claim. In 2005, then FIFA president Sepp Blatter announced that the organisation officially recognised China as the birthplace of modern football and by extension Suju as the first true form of the sport. This announcement is well documented in the Linzer Football Museum, which features a number of unsavoury exhibitions glorifying Blatter and his cronies. Given that Blatter was expelled from FIFA amidst an FBI probe into corruption and financial mismanagement during his tenure as president, it is natural that his claims are questioned. It is however undeniable that Suju is, in most ways that matter, far more reminiscent of the sport that is loved around the world today than mob football, or any other form of the sport that originates in Europe. The act of manipulating an object with the human foot likely goes far further back into history than the Han Dynasty, and therefore it can be argued that attempting to identify the exact birthplace and date of football is futile. 
However, perhaps the answer can be hinted at via the Silk Road. The Silk Road is the name given to the trade routes that connected East Asia with Southern Europe via the Middle East. The historian John Key credits the Han Imperial envoy Zhang Chan as the pioneer of the Silk Road, whose westward expeditions occurred during the height of Suju's emergence during the Han Dynasty. The theory that the techniques and equipment of Suju travelled to Europe via the Silk Road to influence the transformation of mob football into the modern game has given credence by the development of similar sports in Italy, the end point of the Silk Road in Southern Europe. But more on that later. While popular opinion in Britain would dictate that football is a homegrown phenomenon, claiming ownership of the global game is reductive at best and jingoistic at worst. Modern football may have been codified on the playing fields of English private schools, but the game as we know it today is the confluence of ideas from all over the world, not the culmination of a national tradition. Although modern football has taken inspiration from sports the world over, the rules of the game were formulated in England. While mob football may have been the preserve of the peasantry, modern football was pioneered by the ruling classes of 19th century England. The first recorded instance of football rules being written down can be found in 1815 at Eton College, the elite boarding school that was later attended by both David Cameron and Boris Johnson. This was part of a trend, popularised by the rugby school in Warwickshire, that physical outdoor sports were necessary for peoples to grow to become the strong leaders the British Empire would need in order to maintain its geopolitical strength during this period. Therefore, the early rules of football were written in such a way as to encourage physical play that bordered on the outright violence English fans would now associate with Tony Pulis' Stoke City outfit. A practice known as hacking was promoted, wherein a defending player would kick the shins of an attacker in possession of the ball. Eventually, hacking became such a controversial aspect of the sport that in 1863, the newly founded Football Association held a series of meetings to resolve the future rules of the game. In these meetings, it was decided that football in England were followed the University of Cambridge's interpretation of the rules, which forbade hacking and outfield players carrying the ball with their hands. Not all of the rules agreed upon in 1863 are present today, however this moment is generally accepted as the starting point of modern football. A crucial point in the development of modern football from this episode is often missed. The emergence of the world's favourite sport is a by-product of British imperialism. Australian academic Brian Stoddard suggests the sport was a significant tool used by the British Empire in order to transfer dominant British beliefs as to social behaviour, standards, relations and conformity. This wide-ranging influence of sport was consolidated through avenues such as organisation ceremony, patterns of participation and exclusion, competition against both the imperial power and the other colonial states, and the strong centralisation of authority in England and especially in London, the capital of empire. Just as schoolmasters at Eton had used organised sport to create a generation of strong leaders to protect British interests around the world, officials around the British Empire also used organised sport to promote a sense of British cultural hegemony within territories they sought to conquer. Cricket is often associated with this kind of soft power in the Indian subcontinent, however football was also used. Stoddart notes that football matches were first organised in Calcutta in 1880, and by the early 20th century Indian citizens had begun to form their own local teams. However, it was the impact of British imperialism in South America that truly set the British code of football on its path to world domination. While the British Empire never held territories in Brazil, their presence was felt in the region. Professor Ross G. Foreman suggests that Britain exercised what would now be referred to as economic imperialism in Brazil during the late 19th century. He suggests that Britain wielded significant influence over Brazil during this time, with British officials involved in economic activities such as mining, construction and agriculture. This was a consequence of the events of 1808, when Great Britain provided a military escort and protection for the relocation of the Portuguese court from Lisbon to Rio de Janeiro during the Peninsular War. In return, João VI of Portugal granted the British unfettered access to Brazil's ports. This agreement brought British traders, workers and by extension football to Brazil. It is believed that the first game of football in Brazil, a five-a-side match in 1894, was organised by a Mr Thomas Donohoe. Donohoe was a textile worker from Glasgow who had moved to Brazil the previous year to work at a textile factory near Rio. The first Brazilian professional football club, Club Atletico São Paulo, was actually founded six years prior to Thomas Donohoe's kickabout in Rio. The club was founded by British expatriates who worked for the British-owned São Paulo Railway Company. Initially they were a cricket club, but in 1901 they became one of the founding members of the Liga Paulista de Futebol, Brazil's first ever professional football league. The club's move from cricket to football is believed to have been inspired by Charles Miller, one of the club's star players. Miller was born in Brazil to a Scottish railway engineer, 
but attended an independent boarding school in Southampton as a child. It was here that he learnt to play football, and when he returned to Brazil as an adult he did so with two footballs and a copy of the modern football rulebook. Miller also played high-level football while in England, crucially appearing for London-based sides Corinthian Football Club. Corinthian FC folded in 1939, however around the turn of the 20th century they were one of the most well-known teams in football. They were an amateur team, but were comprised of a squad of highly talented players. In 1899 it was said that Corinthian FC were the only team outside of the Football League that could compete with Preston North End, the reigning English champions, and for two international matches in the 1890s the entire England team was comprised of Corinthian players. The latter achievement has never been matched, although plenty of teams have gotten the better of Preston North End in the interceding years. Corinthian FC may now be defunct, but they are still relatively well known for two things. Firstly, the club was strict believers in honest, fair play. They even refused to engage with penalties, instead allowing teams to score penalties against them whilst attempting to deliberately hit the crossbar if they were rewarded one. This ethos, referred to as Corinthian spirit, is a natural extension of the values bred on the playing fields of Eton and Cambridge. Corinthian spirit, or at least our recollection of it, calls to mind the British values identified by Stoddard, namely teamwork, the value of obeying constituted authority, courage in the face of adversity, loyalty to fellow players and respect for the rules. These values were not merely designed to create a generation of effective imperial officials, but were intended to offer imperial subjects something to aspire to and act as a way to regulate their behaviour. Corinthian FC were incredibly effective at exporting this cultural form of power, or what we would today call soft power. During the early 20th century, the team embarked on a number of spectacular world tours, competing against local teams across Europe, Africa and the Americas. The team were incredibly popular and their legacy can be felt to this day. Real Madrid's white kit is homage to Corinthian FC, as is the kit and name of Corinthians Paulista, one of Brazil's most successful ever clubs. In many ways, Corinthian FC were an earlier incarnation of teams like Manchester City or Paris Saint-Germain, a club whose sole purpose was not purely to delight the fans. While Corinthian FC were not overtly backed by the British state in the way the previous examples are exclusively financed by oil-rich Gulf states, they had the effect of projecting a positive image of Britain to the world. However, this imperial dynamic played a key role in popularising modern football across the globe. Without this imperialistic mindset, football may not be as widespread as it is today. In recent years there have been many conversations about the impact of external forces, primarily from the world of politics and finance, on football. As the example of Corinthian FC demonstrates, there has always been a political element to football. While the soft power benefits Corinthian FC brought to Great Britain were subtle and largely unintended, state involvement in football significantly predates the 21st century. Today we call this sports washing, the act of a corporation or nation state using sport to enhance its reputation. However, it was not oil rich Gulf states that first identified football as an avenue to distract the man on the street from their human rights abuses. In fact, the practice of using football to obfuscate from atrocities dates back to the 1930s. The governments of many fascist countries in Europe use sport, and specifically football, as a way to present a more positive face to the rest of the world. An example of this that may be familiar to English football fans would be the fixture between England and Germany in 1935. The game, which England won 3-0, was played at the home ground of Tottenham Hotspur, a club famed for its Jewish support. Prior to kick-off, the German players performed a Nazi salute as their national anthem played. In hindsight, this was a shameful episode, and the Football Association's poor decision-making in allowing such a public and offensive display of fascism in an area of London with a traditionally large Jewish community is deplorable. However, as an act of sports washing, the England-Germany fixture in 1935 is not a million miles away from FIFA's decision to allow Russia to host the 2018 World Cup, ignoring the country's hostile foreign policy, suppression of LGBT communities and interference in foreign elections. While the link between football and politics dates back to at least the 19th century, the connection only became apparent in Italy in the 1930s. Football has a long history in Italy. A sport known as Calcio Fiorentino was played by Florentine nobles in the 16th century and involved two teams attempting to carry a ball from one goal to another using their hands or feet. The consensus holds that Italian Calcio was a revival of Harpustum, the Roman ball game with similar rules to rugby. The rule that allows players to use their hands would support this. However, Italy was a major trading hub during the Middle Ages and was one of the final destinations along the Silk Road. Furthermore, Florence, the city where football in Italy originated from, was a region whose prosperity grew from international trade. 
This would suggest that at least some elements of Calcio Fiorentino may have been inspired by Chinese Tsuju or other similar Asian ball games. Wherever the sport of Calcio comes from, its tradition was leapt upon by Italian fascist leader Benito Mussolini. Sports historian Bill Murray argues that Mussolini's regime was the first government to make sport a central pillar of their agenda. In 1930, eight years after seizing power, Mussolini declared football to be Italy's national sport, a notion that plays upon the history of Calcio. Mussolini recognised that he could use the Italian national team's success on the pitch to promote a positive image of Italian fascism to the rest of the world. To this end, the Italian government put up a significant sum of money to ensure that they were selected as the host of the 1934 World Cup. The Italian team triumphed in the final, beating Czechoslovakia 2-1 in the aptly named National Stadium of the National Fascist Party in Rome. In their match report after the game, popular right-leaning newspaper Il Popolo d'Italia stated that the Italian team had demonstrated harmony, discipline, order and courage in their victory. These values, while seemingly admirable, are clearly linked to fascist ideals. Mussolini wanted to ensure that his national team exemplified these ideals, both to act as an ideal to his countrymen and to prove to the rest of the world that Italians were superior to their rivals. This was clearly an important project to Il Duce, who allegedly bribed officials to ensure that Italy would win. Mussolini's embracing of football as a form of soft power was wildly successful, and it was proved so by the policy's legacy. It is widely believed that Adolf Hitler's inspiration for the 1936 Berlin Olympics was Italy's triumph in 1934. Moreover, the legacy of football in Italy's association with fascism can clearly be seen in the contemporary game. However, the true consequence of football's flirtation with 1930s fascism can be seen today through the actions of certain owners and stakeholders in the sport. Mussolini proved that footballing success could endear people to a controversial cause. A handful of oil-rich states with dubious human rights issues that hold football hostage today are merely following a playbook that was written 90 years ago. Given the global popularity of football, our collective understanding of the sport's past is relatively poor. In the UK, what we know is coloured by patriotism and narrow-mindedness, with most fans imagining a simplified lineage that starts with medieval peasants kicking a pig's butt around a field and ends with Bobby Moore lifting the Jules Rimet trophy. There is little understanding or appreciation for the global history of the game, and even less thought given to considering how Britain's colonial past influenced the spread of football around the world. Perhaps if we gave more thought to understanding the history of football, from Chinese Tsuju to Corinthian spirit and Italian Calcio, we would better understand the sport's current, uncertain future. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope it taught you something new. If there are any questions, please leave a comment or reach out to me on Twitter. If you require further assistance regarding academic writing, history lessons or English comprehension, you can find my tutoring profiles below.